Our episodes deal with serious and often distressing incidents. Listener discretion is advised. We've got guns. We'll use them. Now everybody stay quiet and nobody do anything stupid. Where's the money? I'm JS and this is Skinwalker. Howard Wilson was born in Govan Hill, in the south side of Glasgow, in 1938. Born to working class parents, Howard grew up in an area overflowing with multi-occupant tenement flats and slum housing. Glasgow was particularly hard hit by World War II and Govan Hill was no exception. The buildings were black with grime and dirt and thick smog often enveloped the whole city as a result of nearby heavy industry. The area was at breaking point. Like most people around him in Govan Hill, Howard didn't have much and not much was expected of him. Despite this, Howard was ambitious. Seeing the local villains being led to the cells of the Southern Police Office on Craigie Street near his Govan Hill home, by the City of Glasgow policemen in their double-breasted jackets and tall hats made a deep impression on Howard. As he grew, he dreamt of joining their ranks. Howard's upbringing had not been perfect. His father had died in an army accident when he was only a toddler. His mother, despite earning a modest living, ensured that he would be enabled to stay away from the readily available temptations of Govan Hill. She enrolled Howard at Glasgow Academy, a school for the wealthy and high achievers of Glaswegian society. It would have been a significant burden for a local pocket in those days. He worked hard at the school, earning a reputation as a decent rugby player. However, he still had to return to Govan Hill when the school bell tolled, and in Govan Hill, violence could earn good money. Or at least it could earn you a fearsome reputation, which could, in turn, eventually lead to good money. With good money being hard to come by in poverty-stricken post-war Glasgow, many of the faces he grew up with fell into Glasgow's criminal fraternity but not Howard. He stuck to his books, eventually serving his mandatory two years national service and returning without a blemish on his record. After 20 years of avoiding the temptation on offer, his application was accepted and he was granted his policeman's badge, jacket and hat and inducted as constable of the City of Glasgow Police in 1958. Howard was a diligent and hard-working officer during his early tenure, receiving the Chief Constable's commendations for zeal and efficiency during his service. The only blight on Howard's record was a bribery allegation, but nothing concrete was ever proven. Howard walked away from the incident with his reputation intact. Despite his hard work and zeal, Howard couldn't change the fact that he was from Govan Hill. To some of his colleagues, this meant he was anathema to them, and more likened to the so-called criminal classes they were attempting to apprehend. Howard persistently applied for a promotion to sergeant, proposing the value his abilities would add to the hierarchy of the City of Glasgow Police. His words fell on deaf ears. Time after time, Howard would apply. Time after time, Howard would be refused and be made to return to his beat, walking Glasgow's grimy streets. During his service, Howard found a woman to love. They were wed in a local church and had a child. Eventually, in 1968, Howard decided he couldn't take the rejections and judgement from his superiors any longer. He tendered his resignation and set out to be a self-made man. He set up a greengrocer's in Mount Florida, nearby to his native Govan Hill. By this time, post-war regeneration had made the area a much more attractive proposition for business. Much of the grime and dirt had been washed from the buildings, turning them from black stone to their original salmon pink or blonde sandstone. Howard had also recently gotten himself a new group of friends. Ian Donaldson and John Sim were Howard's new cronies and both were ex-police service. Ian had served as a police officer within the City of Glasgow Force, 
and John was a prison officer turned mechanic. There was also a loose fourth member to their group, Archibald McGeechy, who would sometimes join them for their weekly card games. Howard, Ian and John were also members of the Bears Den Rifle Club, where often they went to practice target shooting. The club gave the group access to various calibres of shooting pistols and rifles, along with live ammunition to practice on the range. Having had firearms training within his policing role, Howard was a natural. However, by late 1968, business at the greengrocers had begun to decline rapidly. The two operations were hemorrhaging money and Howard knew it. His wife was pregnant, so he had another baby on the way to think about too. One night in the spring of 1969, as he played cards and drank long into the night with Sim and Donaldson, they discussed their own respective money problems. It appeared within their group being penniless was contagious. One of the crew jokingly suggested they rob a bank. When they awoke the next morning, jest turned to reality and they began the planning of a bank heist. Due to their experience, they put together a sensible route of attack and set a date. The group knew they could handle the situation within the bank. All they needed was a means of escape. They reached out to the occasional fourth member of their posse, Archibald McGeechy, and asked him to come in on the scheme as their getaway driver. McGeechy agreed. Howard Wilson still needed a weapon, and he knew where to get one. He approached the president of his gun club, the Bears Den Rifle Club, about acquiring a small pistol. It was legal at the time in Scotland to buy small pistols, and with his interest in range shooting, it wouldn't have seemed suspicious for him to make this request. All of the parts for the robbery were now in play. All they needed now was to execute their plan. On July 16, 1969, tellers at the British Linen Bank on Eastwood Mains Road, in the suburb of Williamwood, just on the outskirts of Glasgow, were winding down for the day. As they were completing their ledgers and filling in their remaining paperwork, three men emerged through the open door of the branch. They quickly closed and sealed the door behind them. One was brandishing a gun. That man, although the bank staff didn't know it, was Howard Wilson. Wilson quickly took control of the situation, brandishing liquid ammonia in the faces of the bank staff alongside the gun he held in his hand was enough to subdue any resistance. The bank manager, Len Archibald, his assistant David Gowans, and tellers Ian Shaw and Helga Muirhead were bound, gagged and blindfolded with pillowcases placed over their heads. The remaining building users were corralled into one central area for the crew to manage during the heist. The staff were compliant and the men got their money. Within 15 minutes, they walked out with £20,876, an amount which is equivalent to around £340,000 in 2019. The wheelman, Archibald McGeechy, got them safely out of the area. When the terrified bank staff realised the ordeal was over, they freed themselves and attempted to phone the police to alert them to the robbery. The line was dead. They had to go to a neighbouring unit to use theirs. Wilson's crew had cut their phone line just in case. The police were none the wiser a crime had even taken place until a significant amount of time had passed since the incident. The team returned to their designated safe house, divided the profits between the crew, parted ways and returned to their daily routine. As Howard Wilson and his crew were experienced in administering the law, it ensured they were careful in avoiding detection by the police after the heist. There were no extravagant purchases, there were no cars, holiday homes or mink coats. They simply used the money to assist them with their ongoing individual money crises. The only problem was, 
Stealing from banks did little to address the issues which plagued their failing businesses. They merely papered over the cracks. By December, the three ringleaders of the crew were broke and in need of money once again, and they had a new target to address this. The Clydesdale Bank on Bridge Street in Linwood, just outside of Glasgow. There was one key issue. Archibald McGeechy wasn't sold on the idea. Despite enjoying the proceeds of the first robbery, McGeechy didn't see the necessity in involving himself with robbing another bank. What exactly was said will never be fully known. After McGeechy declared himself out, he was never seen again. There has been strong suspicions and allegations that as Howard Wilson now viewed him as a weak link, Wilson killed McGeechy. There are further allegations that Wilson then threw McGeechy's body into the River Clyde, deep into extensive underwater concrete supports which were being constructed at the time as part of the Kingston Bridge in Glasgow. Electing not to bring anyone else in on their new plan, the team proceeded as a three-man crew. Wilson, Donaldson and Sim hit the Clydesdale Bank in Linwood on December 30. 1969. The hit went smoothly. The team rolled into the bank office, took control of the situation, locked the doors behind them and bound and gagged anyone who may hold any seniority or pose any threat. While the raid was ongoing, a lady and her young child knocked at the locked door of the bank to be let in. She hoped to sneak a transaction through despite it appearing to be after closing time. She was allowed through the door by one of Howard Wilson's crew. A gun was brandished at her and her small child and they were forced over to sit with the other terrified bank occupants. Yet Howard Wilson and his crew had forgotten to do one crucial thing. They had not bound the lady who had come in with her child. While Wilson and his crew were preoccupied with loading their loot into their cases and bags, the young lady frantically set to work freeing the bank workers from their bonds. One of the crew returned to the room in which the bound and terrified victims were being held and noticed the young lady fast at work untying the bonds. He held a gun to her head, then to the head of her two-year-old child. He threatened to shoot the child and then the mother. Luckily, the pleas of the room were listened to. He lowered the gun. The remainder of the team then came through, motioning that it was time to leave. The gang exited the building with £14,212 in cash and a large box stuffed with silver coins. The coins were an afterthought. One of the crew had simply seen them as they were looting and thought, why not earn some extra money? The getaway was uneventful. Just like when the team hit the linen bank months earlier, the police were never even on the tail of the gang and they simply drove to Howard Wilson's house at 51 Allison Street in Govan Hill to divide the spoils. As the team began unloading the spoils of their victory from the rear of the getaway vehicle outside of Howard Wilson's flat, Inspector Andrew Hislop, a 44-year-old who had spent most of his working life within the force, happened to snatch a glance at the crew. He immediately recognised Howard, having served alongside him at the Craigie Street station. Inspector Hislop had suspicions about Howard. He hadn't been fond of him during their shared time within the city of Glasgow Police. Furthermore, some whispers of his conduct after leaving the force had raised some eyebrows. Seeing Howard unload these large suitcases into his flat with two cronies in tow didn't sit right with him. News of the robbery had failed to filter through to Craigie Street at this point. Communications across policing was less immediate than it is today, given the technological limitations. Nothing but intuition and experience had led Inspector Hislop to mistrust Howard Wilson's behaviour. Without hesitation, he radioed for backup and moved closer to the vehicle parked at the door of 51 Allison Street and the crew portering its contents to the flat. As he neared, he was spotted by Howard Wilson. Wilson gestured for him to come over and greeted him in friendly terms. 
When Inspector Hislop asked to come in, Howard Wilson seemed happy to oblige him. They spoke in good-natured terms at the edge of the living room door. That is, until Inspector Hislop requested to look inside one of the suitcases. He expected to find stolen alcohol or other illicit goods, which he suspected would then be resold legally through Howard's business. One of the crew peeled back the zip. As the suitcase was pulled open, Inspector Hislop was met with two equally sinister sights. The first was a large pile of banknotes stuffed haphazardly within the suitcase. The second was Howard Wilson holding a gun to his forehead. He pulled the trigger. The gun jammed. Andrew Hislop desperately fought for his life, struggling with the gun toting Wilson. The gun erupted a second time, piercing through Inspector Andrew Hislop, exiting through his spine and leaving bullet fragments in his neck. At that moment, the backup which had been requested by Inspector Hislop as he approached the flat arrived. John Sellers, 37, Angus McKenzie, 31, and Edward Barnett, a 24-year-old officer, emerged through the front door. Seeing Wilson holding a firearm, John Sellers made a run for the bathroom, holding the door shut behind him. Howard Wilson roared to his companions, That bastard has a radio. Get him. Sellers frenetically radioed the station on Craigie Street pleading as much as requesting for backup. It was one of only five personal radios in the entire station and it would ultimately save John Seller's life. Wilson repeatedly forced the door ajar but could not get a clean shot at John Sellers. Abandoning his attempt to murder him, Wilson turned his attention to the two remaining officers of the law. Angus McKenzie was shot first. He fell to the floor under the weight of his injuries whereby he was callously murdered by a further single point blank shot to the head. Edward Barnett was shot next. His wounds were not immediately fatal, however, he died five days later in hospital. He left behind two young children and a wife. It was his first day within the CID unit at Craigie Street. Somewhere amongst this chaos, John Sim stood frozen to the spot open-mouthed in fear. A bank robber he may be, but cold-blooded cop killer was not in his nature. Ian Donaldson was equally as averse to turning from bank robbers into murderers, however, he was not stricken to the spot as his compatriot was. Donaldson had taken advantage of the chaos to leap from the open window of the ground floor flat on the street beside. At this, DC Campbell arrived at the flat. He struggled with Wilson, who lost control of his weapon. John Sellers ran from the bathroom to assist his colleague. Outmanned and out of bullets and options, Howard Wilson surrendered to DC Campbell. He was apprehended, cuffed and taken only a couple of hundred yards from the infamous flat on Allison Street to Craigie Street Police Office alongside John Sim. Ian Donaldson was apprehended later that same day, having failed to escape after his daring attempt at an escape act. Howard Wilson's wife returned at this juncture, having been sent away for the day with Wilson's best intentions and smooth words ringing in her ears. She returned to their home to find police roaming and investigating every inch of their family home. She divorced Wilson soon after and never spoke a further word publicly about her experiences. News of the arrest quickly filtered throughout the station and beyond. Huddled together in a cell, Wilson and his accomplices required an armed guard during their overnight in the Craigie Street Police Station. The guard was reportedly the biggest and toughest officer in the station. He was there to protect the group from reprisal attacks from officers who had watched their colleagues die and felt the crew deserved the same fate. Every newspaper in the United Kingdom ran headlines concerning the slayings in the days following. An ex-cop murdering serving officers and nearly killing another was as galling in London 
as it was in Glasgow. Talk on the streets quickly turned to punishment. Scotland had abolished the death penalty for crimes in 1965, but the public wanted blood. The widows of the murdered police officers held a rally in Glasgow looking for Parliament to re-examine the position on capital punishment and make use of it for the neck of Howard Wilson. Bailey James Anderson, Glasgow's police convener, stated at the time that with the abolition of hanging, it was well worth criminals shooting it out with police. It was a sentiment shared by the thousand marchers protesting in Glasgow. At one point, Politicians felt that conceding to the crowd and reopening the debates on capital punishment was one of the only ways to defuse the situation. However, in time, the mood calmed, and Scotland's complete ban on capital punishment held. Howard Wilson would have been a certainty to hang in the event of a reversal. It is without a doubt that he must have breathed a deep sigh of relief. The trials of Howard Wilson, Ian Donaldson and John Sim were not difficult in the eyes of the prosecution. Wilson himself was notably subdued during the trial. Sim and Donaldson were willing to assist the prosecution. They wanted to be tried as bank robbers rather than to be seen as both bank robbers and accomplices to the murder of police officers. Donaldson had the most reliable defence to this. He had dived out the window at the first opportunity to distance himself from Howard Wilson's actions. John Sims' defence counsel successfully proved he was unaware of Wilson's intentions to murder the police officers in the Allison Street flat. As such, they were both sentenced to 12 years for the respective crimes committed during the robbery of both the British Linen Bank and the Clydesdale Bank in Linwood. Howard Wilson was found guilty of the murders of Edward Barnett and Angus Mackenzie. The severe injuries given to Inspector Andrew Hislop and the bank robberies. He was sentenced to 25 years to life for the murder and a further 12 years for the bank robberies. It was and remains one of the most substantial sentences ever given in a Scots court of law. The British Linen Bank and the Clydesdale Bank both successfully sued the heist team in respect of the monies they had stolen during the break-ins. None of the money was ever repaid. When Howard Wilson went to prison, he was initially housed in Peterhead. His conduct was, expectedly, troublesome. He was involved in a prison riot which put the lives of six correctional officers in danger. This led to Wilson being selected for Porterfield Prison's notorious segregation cages, with six additional years to his sentence in tow. As the name would suggest, the cages were four walls of iron bars, the other men on the segregation row and little else. In these gloomy surrounds, he had little but a can for a toilet to keep him company. His cell neighbour was Jimmy Boyle, a notorious gangster. The two of them led a riot in response to their prison conditions, which led to one warden being stabbed and another suffering serious injuries. Wilson eventually settled into prison life. He took to reading and writing as forms of self-betterment. Finding he had a tremendous passion for the creation of stories, Wilson wrote a novel named Angels of Death during his time in prison. It was published by Argyle Publishing in 1994. It became somewhat notorious due to the offer and its content. It dealt with a mass murderer let loose in New York. He was ultimately moved to Castle Huntley Prison in Perthshire, Scotland. This facility was much more relaxed than Peterhead and Porterfield. It allowed inmates the opportunity to seek employment and have a much greater degree of freedom than they typically would have experienced in a prison environment. The advent of the European Court's right to freedom assisted Wilson. As his sentence was 25 to life, the system was under no duress to seek or listen to his request for parole. However, 
The right to freedom asserted that it was illegal within the European Union to deny an individual the right to know the date at which they can seek freedom. In 2002, Howard Wilson's case was re-examined in light of this development and it was agreed that he was considered as time served and given notice of his impending release from prison. It had been 33 years since he murdered Edward Burnett and Angus Mackenzie. They had been the same 33 years in which Andrew Hislop had to adapt to life as a paralysed man. Howard Wilson currently resides in Perth. His exact personal circumstances are not public record. After the events at 51 Allison Street, many of the officers involved were recognised for their heroism. Having gone from a typical working day into one of Scottish policing's most deadly and distressing situations with bravery and poise, the awards were duly deserved. Both Andrew Hislop and DC Campbell were awarded the George Medal, one of the country's most recognisable and prized medals for gallantry. DC Angus Mackenzie and Constable Edward Barnett were both given decorated funerals carried by their colleagues and commended for their bravery in the face of danger. They were awarded posthumous Queen's Medals for Gallantry. A thousand marchers to demand like for life retribution for their deaths stood testament to the public's perception of their heroic actions and the justice which should have been meted out to the perpetrators as a result. In 1971, John Sellers was presented with a gallantry medal by the Glasgow Corporation. Given to him personally by the Lord Provost for Glasgow, Sir Donald Liddell. John Sellers eventually grew disillusioned with Glasgow in 1976. Slow progression through the ranks and the memory of Allison Street firmly in his mind, he moved his family to Sussex and joined the Sussex Police. As of at least May 26, 2019, John Sellers was alive and living in the south of England, the proud father of three children. Andrew Hislop survived his encounter with Howard Wilson, but he bore the scars of that day for the remainder of his life. Andrew Hislop never walked again and lived in incredible pain as a result of his injuries. As a result, he had to give up the role he loved in the police force. He eventually moved to the quiet Isle of Isla, off of Scotland's west coast, where he lived until 2000, passing age 74. We hope you've enjoyed today's episode. Gaining exposure and attracting new listeners is massively important for a new podcast, and we just want to share this whole experience with you and people like you. We would tremendously appreciate if after you listen, you follow us on Instagram at Skinwalker True Crime and rate our podcast on whichever platform you use to download your podcasts. If you have any interesting thoughts in the case, theories or new cases for us to cover, feel free to reach out. We're glad to have you.